Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! My aunt was one of two kids my grandparents had. My mother was a solar opposite to my aunt. She worked from the age of 12 in my grandfather's shop, never asked for anything, and eventually managed to start her own business. My aunt never held down a job till the age of 26, was constantly stealing from her parents, and was constantly in trouble. Despite this, my aunt was spoiled by my grandmother. And so were her kids. She had three kids from three different men and her first husband was not one of them, if you know what I mean. Didn't matter what my aunt or her kids did, my grandmother would always jump to their defense. She never had time for my mom and her kids unless it was to get something from us. The only reason my mom would visit her was because she loved my grandfather. My grandfather passed away in 2004, and a few months after my nan decided to write up a new will, my mother and my aunt were both present for it when she signed it, so they knew what was in it. It made it so that when she passed away, her home would be sold, and the money split 25 each to my mom and aunt, and the remaining 50% would go evenly to the grandkids. At the time, the home was worth more than 500,000 pounds. So it will be a nice little inheritance, but nothing life-changing. In 2010, my mom died after an accident and did not have a current will in place. As she no longer had her business and was renting a house, she didn't have anything of much monetary value. The only thing she was concerned about was what would be done at her funeral should she pass away. What had told me everything she wanted? The music, the flowers, the coffin color, and even what people were to wear at the funeral. She wanted people to wear bright warm colors. So when she passed, my aunt and Nan took over all the arrangements and tried to undo all the things I told them. The songs were going to be songs I knew mom didn't like. The flowers were all the wrong colors and they picked a hideous coffin. With the help of my siblings, we were able to change a few of the things back to what they were supposed to be. But the coffin couldn't be changed for some reason. And my nan refused to let people come dressed as clowns. So it was all black. It was frustrating. After the funeral, my nan had her well changed. My siblings and I were told by our aunt that she didn't have any involvement with the writing of the will, and our nan told us that she changed it so that my mom share would go to her kids instead. All good. We thought. After mom passed away, my nan just stopped talking about my mom. At first, we thought it was because she was still recovering from losing her daughter, but even five years after mom passed, she still wouldn't talk about her. Even if you brought up a story about mom, Nan would very obviously try to change the subject, usually about how hard my aunt and her annoying kids had it. And if you want to talk to her about your own problems, she would somehow bring it back to my aunt. I had suffered the mental breakdown after my mom's death, so you can imagine how much it hurt to hear, well, X has had it so much worse. In 2016, my nan passed away. She had written down what she wanted to be done for her funeral. And it was basically all the same things she had picked out for my mom's funeral. Even the music to be played. I don't know why she tried to have a dress rehearsal funeral using my mom as a stand-in. But it was obvious that's what she was trying to do. So after a couple of months, our siblings and I were waiting to hear about the well reading. And my aunt kept telling me, oh, it'll be another month before we can do the reading. I didn't mind. I wasn't fussed about the money to be honest, but my oldest brother was hoping to use the money to pay for a honeymoon for him and his then fiance, and my younger brother was about to start university, so it would be a hell of a help. Eventually, my dad bumped into the solicitor my grandmother had used to deal with her will and asked what was happening. The solicitor let slip that the will had already been read and that it left everything to my aunt. When my dad questioned this, the solicitor told him that my aunt had been present when the will was written, despite promising that she had nothing to do with it. 
When confronted, my aunt initially tried to deny, but eventually admitted to lying to all of us. She showed us the will and it confirmed what we already knew. The house and all its contents were now my aunt's. This included my granddad's war medals. He fought in the Second World War. When I told her that he had promised them to me before he died, she said, well, unless you have it in writing, you will have nothing in this house. Anyway, I already gave them to Clive. My heart sank. Clive, not his real name obviously, was her eldest son. The dictionary definition of a screw-up. He's been in and out of prison for stealing and dealing drugs. I knew that the moment that prick had got his hands on my granddad's medals, they would have been sold off. We looked into taking her to court over the will, but everyone we spoke to said that we probably wouldn't get anything out of it. She immediately put the house up for sale at close to £750,000 and she had pissed off too many people in our town. So she was going to sell the house and move closer to her daughter, who lives in a big city. An offer was made on the house and she put down a deposit on a house near the big city. And I thought, that was it. Here is where karma comes into play. The people who wanted my nan's house had a survey done of the house to see if there were issues. And oh boy, were there. Turns out that the land the house was built on was way too soft for the type of house it was. And it was practically sinking. It has sunk about 2 cm in the 40 plus years my nan and granddad had lived there. But the sinking was accelerating to 1 cm per year now. This meant that within the next 3 years, the house would need some serious work or be knocked down. The new value of the house? 60,000 pounds. The buyers immediately pulled out. Having not even put down a deposit, she couldn't buy her new house, but still had to pay the deposit on it. And while this was happening, she let Clive move in with her into her house that she rented from the council. He wasn't allowed to live in any of the council houses because he had trashed every single one he'd ever been given. Someone reported this and she was kicked out of her home. She was forced to move into my nan's old home as she couldn't live anywhere else. So there she is, living in a crumbling house with her jerk son and her partner. She was stuck there for two years. Every time I saw her, she would try and start talking to me. And I would just ignore her and walk off. One time, as I was walking away, she screamed, Your mother deserved to die for having an R word like you. In the middle of a busy street, someone reported her to the police and she had an official warning from them. I was ridiculed on Facebook. Every time I saw her after that, she looked more and more miserable. Eventually, she sold the house for something like 85,000 pounds and moved in with her daughter in a big city. I lost contact with her and her kids after this. I thought karma had been issued. Oh, but karma still wasn't done with her. I bumped into one of her former friends and she told me what happened after she left our town. She moved into her daughter's home, let's call her Sue, but they only had a three-bedroom house and three kids. My aunt and her partner had to live in the smallest room in the house while my aunt looked for a job and a home to rent. Even with 85,000 pounds, she couldn't afford a home anywhere. After about a month, my aunt's partner ran off after emptying her account. She was left stranded in Sue's house, not contributing anything because all the money she makes goes into bingo. Eventually, Sue and my aunt got into a screaming match and my aunt said something along the lines of, I should have aborted you. Sue immediately kicked her out of her house. So there is my aunt in a city where she knows nobody, no money, no home, and the last bridge she had was a smoldering rick. And the last bridge she had was a smoldering rick. Last anyone has heard, she was living in a caravan in the roughest part of the city. And she can no longer work because she's suffering early onset arthritis and can no longer move her hands. I know I shouldn't get joy out of something like this happening to another person, but it does bring me some peace as to what happened. When I was much younger, I had the chance of living a bit far from my hometown in a semi-rural area. At some place with a nice green space, next to a very nice neighbor with her own green space adjacent to mine. 
It was some closed neighborhood with a few common expenses for maintenance of the inner roads and such stuff, yet not with an HOA in the same way as in the USA, according to what I read around here. There were just a few homes there, between 25 and 35. I can't recall exactly now. And everybody had an equal vote on issues regarding the common spaces and issues. There was never any problem, really, never. My nice neighbor was a lady in her 50s. She was very funny, witty, smart and really lovely. She had a boyfriend who used to be there from Friday to Sunday every week. And he was equally nice. Adorable people, both of them, really. I always helped her with her green space, quite more than a garden, whenever I took care of mine. Which was quite often. I didn't mind helping her with that since her boyfriend wasn't able to. It wasn't that easy for him to do that stuff since he had some back issues and was getting treatment for it. And for me it wasn't a big deal. And after all the tasty stuff she cooked and gave me, hey, try this, tell me if you like it. That was a recurrent sentence. It was the least I could do for her. Also her two dogs were with me all the time when I was in her place. And they were just adorable. Well, as it happens, one day they decided to move to some city quite a few hundred kilometers from there. And they wanted to get married. So she put the house on sale. Some people came to see the house, which was beautiful. So I was doing the usual gardening work at her place with a couple who later bought the house were first visiting. I didn't pay much attention, but I remembered afterward it was them because she, the girl in the couple, had a very distinctive voice in a very high pitch, yet not unpleasant. Her unpleasantness would show later, but not regarding her voice. Also, her husband was much taller than her, like two heads taller. We will call him the tall dude from now on. One day my neighbor and her boyfriend said their goodbyes, left with me a few things to donate, the ones they couldn't take care of, some for me if I wanted, I didn't, save for one great cast iron pan that, somehow, they wouldn't take. And they left. I was sad to see them go and they were chasing a good future together, so I was also happy for them. Well, the new neighbors, the entitled neighbors from now on, got there one day and I had been told beforehand by the realtor, so I worked a bit on their green space in order for it to look nice. The entitled neighbor didn't say their hello, yet I didn't mind. They had the right to be less sociable than other people are, and unless they were annoying, I was okay with it. A couple of days after they moved, I was taking care of the grass on my property, cutting some dried branches of a tree, plum, and other things too. Then a high-pitched voice lady, the woman of the couple, called me. I'm translating. Hey boy. When you finish there, you gotta do some work here too. The grass is quite grown and we have more stuff to do. I was a bit confused at first, but then I remembered that when they first visited, I was doing gardening stuff for my former neighbor, and that's why she must have thought it was my duty. I got close to her and explained to her that I was doing maintenance of my property, and that I was friends with my former neighbor and about her boyfriend's situation and why I was helping her. She said okay and went inside her house. A few days later, could have been three days, there was a monthly neighbors meeting. After a few issues were debated, mostly about a few pumps and dirt roads, both entitled neighbors said they had an issue. And the woman said that I was refusing to do my chores and that I should get a reprimand and not be paid in full. I was quiet and calm and was about to speak when another homeowner, who was aware of my relationship with my former neighbor, said he was never getting paid, he doesn't do any work for any of us, he was helping his neighbor, that's it. I added that I already told her that and that I explained to her my relationship with my neighbor and her boyfriend and that I thought I made it quite clear. The tall guy then said that when they visited the house they saw me doing the gardening and assumed that it was included with the common expenses. So it could be said they bought the property under those assumptions. At that moment I was quite amused because the whole issue was ridiculous. I told him something like this. Well, not the exact words. After these years I can't recall every single term. 
I'm sorry that you thought my gardening came for free with the house. It came for free with a relationship I had with my former neighbor. And that's it. No one told you that I will be working for you for free or under common expenses. And your own assumptions are just flawed. I'm sorry. At that point, the lady lost her timber and shouted at me that I was disrespecting her husband and her husband's authority. That I was rude and a bully, an accusation without any truth, and that I was purposefully refusing to do their gardening. After her screaming show, there was a very, very long and uncomfortable silence. I had never witnessed anyone shouting in those meetings, which were very amicable and quiet. So I broke the silence and told her, After what I'm going to say, I will ask my new neighbors to explicitly point out in which ways I was, according to them, rude and bully. I would also like to know in which ways I disrespected her husband and his supposed authority, and also which authority do they think they have over me. On the other hand, they are right. I purposefully refuse to do their gardening, and I will assure you that I will never do it, not even if they want to pay for it. They shut up and left before the meeting was over. Yes, we, the rest, stayed a bit afterwards talking about what happened. It was impossible not to. And then I went to the entitled neighbor's neighbor, a nice old bloke who invited me and a couple other homeowners over. He lived on the other side of the entitled neighbors. He offered us cappuccinos or teas. He seemed to know a lot about tea. Which there I had this idea and I told him, hey, I can come a couple days a week for a little while to take care of your plants and trees, more like bushes really, and I can have a cappuccino here. And he agreed. I had a triple interest in this. 1. The cappuccinos. 2. Angering the entitled neighbors who will see I do some gardening to their other neighbor. And 3. The nice neighbor's granddaughter who was beautiful and I had already seen her around. It all went well. Cappuccinos were great. The entitled neighbors were furious. And the granddaughter ended up being a good friend of mine and introducing me to a friend of hers who would then become my girlfriend. Until she died only six months later, but that's another story. Oh, I also had another interest. The nice neighbor library. He had great books and he lent them to me. Important note. While the facts were, as I wrote here, some words might not be entirely precise. Because this happened more than 25 years ago. And I can't recall every single word. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.